So it's a real pleasure to be introducing one of Australia's trailblazers in safety, Deirdre Lewis. Deirdre is the general manager of HSC for the downstream business at Origin Energy. She has over 25 years experience of operational uh, large high risk in operational large high risk industries. And you may have already heard Deirdre speak before on the pre-accident investigation podcast and at quite a few conferences. And this is because Deirdre is so passionate about sharing her knowledge with others in industry. And Deirdre, we are so thankful that you are passionate about sharing that knowledge. Really, we are very, very grateful. So one of the really uh, interesting things about Safety Differently and the new view of safety is that it's new territory, it's a fresh way of thinking, and there's no particular set way or roadmap on which to operationalize this in our workplaces. So this can be quite daunting for safety practitioners and for organizations to take on. So Deirdre believes that everyone should give it a go anyway. How? Well, you're about to find out. So please welcome Deirdre Lewis to your screen. Thanks, Deirdre. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today. I really appreciate the invitation. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is bumbling forward. Um, and in preparation for this discussion, I sat down and I really thought about what I wanted to talk about today. And I realise with a deep sense of vulnerability that I feel like I've got something to say, but I'm not really okay. quite sure how one. to say it in ah. a way that people will be able to connect to. So I reminded myself that finding the courage to speak up and to do something that feels right, but it's also really risky, is when we not only learn the most, but we also exercise our ability to access our own vulnerability. And I think that's a really um, great thing to be able to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So today, like I said, I'm going to talk to you about bumbling forward. Um, I'll not only talk about my own personal voyage, but also how I've been challenging the mindset, behaviours and the ideology of myself, but also of my organisation. And I'll try and talk to you about um, how this has led to some really difficult um, conversations in the business. Um, it's led to innovation. It's led to a, a sense of renewed uh, purpose for me, but also for my team, but also for the organisation um, in a really deeply messy and a complex environment. Um, so let's just talk about purpose for a few minutes. And um, I'm not sure, like sometimes it takes a little bit of time to step back and really think about what our purpose is. Um, and so um, I did that. And I also was kind of trying to reflect on, well, how does that purpose also relate to my personal values, which are about living life um, with courage and with care. Um, so Maybe you're asking yourself, well, so what? Well, what I thought I might do is actually use that as an opportunity to do some storytelling. So I began my career as a, a biologist, actually, um, for CSIRO, and then I moved into quality and quality assurance, and then eventually that brought me into the world of safety. So one day, many years ago, when I was working as the head of QA and QC in this organisation, um, an operator made a mistake. He bypassed the safety device and ended up with his arm in a screw conveyor um, and he lost his arm. Due to the fast thinking of another operator on that plant, um, he, his life was saved. Um, and then I really, I guess I've been working in the quality area and the business asked me to come in and fix the safety system. Um, so being a really good fixer, I thought, well, I can do that. So that's really how I came into being a safety person per se or a systems person because um, I knew how to do that sort of stuff. So um, I did my research and um, then I kind of thought we'd, we'd kind of move through that and then I thought, well, actually, this is really curious. It's a really curious thing and I found it really rich in terms of the people aspect of things. So I decided that after a while I was going to go and find a job in an organisation who really know how to do this stuff um, and I was really lucky to have been given the opportunity to move into the steel industry. 
was such an amazing opportunity. I learned so much. I, I learned about behavioural safety. I learned about hard, dirty, messy, risky work. I learned from DuPont. I learned about the importance of rules, about compliance. I became an accredited auditor. I learned about self-insurance, you name it, workers' comp, the whole thing. Um, I was an ICAM trained person. I have a green belt in Six Sigma um, and had also done lean manufacturing. Um, I also honed some skills as a coach and worked out that part of my role was really to influence people. So it was a really great a place to learn some of those skills. A few years into that job, another worker um, bypassed the safety device, obviously a different safety device, different business, but essentially both of those workers had broken the same rule um, and the second worker also lost his arm. Now, I reflected on this and I know that neither of those workers came into work on either of those two days thinking, oh, today's the day I'm going to chop my arm off in a screw conveyor. It just wasn't part of what they were thinking about. Um, and then I really later came to understand that what the workers were doing was what all the workers or most of the workers were actually doing on the plant. And that was what the blue line really was. Um, uh, they also knew that um, to stop the plant was something that they said they had, the, the, the organisation said they had the authority to do. But they also had a KPI that the plant really shouldn't be stopped. And they knew that to stop the plant, it costs a million dollars every time you stop the plant. So really, there was these incompatible goals, if you like. Um, and so I started to really reflect later about the capacity and the fact that there was really no capacity in that system and it was really, really brittle. Um, and then if you think about what Todd was talking about around choices, we often talk about the operator made a bad choice or we hear that language a bit, but really that operator really on that day only had two bad choices. One was to bypass the safety device, which he'd done fairly frequently, or one was to stop the machine and cost the business a million dollars. Um, so he kind of, he was in this bit of a pickle. Um, what we didn't realise at the time is that there was plenty of weak signals to tell us that that was going on, um, but we just weren't really attuned to listening to those weak signals. Heaps of near misses had happened, but really nobody thought very much about them because the outcome that we were looking for was a job that was completed, the production went well, and there was no incident. So essentially, we got what we were looking for until we didn't, um, which is a really interesting um, I guess, uh, a thing to think about. And also one of the things on reflection is that even when those things happen, we had no capacity at all to recover. So I decided to have a conversation and put myself out there with a little bit of courage um, and had uh, a conversation with um, a very senior HSE leader at the time. And I said to him, um, in the nicest possible way, because I think I'm a very nice person, um, that I think that we should look at things a little bit differently. And maybe what we need to do is to encourage people to report new misses, to pay attention to some of these weak signals and to listen to our people and to trust them. Um, and maybe we'd learn a little bit more. Now, that conversation, it's probably fair to say, did not go to plan. Um, I was told that those you know, misses were not something that we really wanted and actually there was a KPI in place that said that we wanted less um, high potential near misses reported and actually the goal was to have none of them. Um, it was linked to bonus and it was also linked to managers performance. Um, so I was kind of scratching my head and wondering um, from a values position, where does care and courage fit into these conversations? Um, and that's when I really started to go back to my own roots, um, to do some research, to read, to become more curious again, to find out things I didn't know, to challenge what felt really uncomfortable for me as a human being, and to find out if anybody else out there was also grappling with the same thing. Um, and then I also changed jobs. So this was, uh, I think that conversation happened in 2019, changed jobs in 2011. So 
I look at traditional safety now and um, how many great things it's taught us. Um, I learned some excellent, excellent skills and my personal career has been built and grounded in traditional safety thinking and practice. However, um, my voyage is perhaps or maybe uh, evolution to incorporate this new view of thinking, whether it's safety two differently or hop, um, into my organisation aligns um, more uh, closely with my own um, values and purpose. Um, and I think for me, it's just been an obvious journey um, to, to do that. It feels right. Um, and I know when we talk about feelings, sometimes people get a little bit funny about feelings, but for me, it really feels right um and the thinking really resonates with me and aligns better with my own values as a professional so um I was talking with an old friend of mine um about all sorts of things and we were actually talking about these concepts and sort of um discussing about the fact that this is sort of the same wine in a different bottle but for me it feels like once I've had a bit of a sip of this wine it's almost like you've seen something that you now can't unsee so once again for me it was time to demonstrate some courage as a professional and to work out how I was going to take this wine and breathe life into it in a complex messy and political environment i.e. into a living, breathing, organic, dynamic organisation and one in which is heavily regulated under extreme external pressure is rapidly in a rapidly changing world where we've just been in the midst of a pandemic um, and with a business that actually has a sense that it's reasonably stable. Um, so at times I feel um, we talked about a, we talk about a journey a bit in safety, but actually think that there's no roadmap and for this. And I also think that if I really reflect on it, there's actually not even a road. Um, and um, I think we just have to try to do things differently. Um, so it could be as simple as, for example, changing the language we use, trying a different technique, asking some better questions, listening a little bit better, building relationships. Um, or it could be as big as reframing your strategy or influencing the board, which is what I'm trying to do now, or other functional groups and teams to think differently or try something new. I like the way Eric um, talked about it last year in terms of a voyage rather than a journey. And I kind of it, it kind of brings me to this idea of like our ancestors and how millennia ago um, some really courageous people in their dugout canoes decided that they were going to go on a voyage and there was no map, there was no, there was no path. Um, but that they were walking or, or, or sailing into this space that was volatile, uncertain, complex um, and dynamic and also full of this ambiguity that Todd just talked about. But what I'm sure they had was a sense of purpose and a plan for what they really wanted to do. And I guess this is where, for me, I think that we're at, or, or practitioners, I think, uh, are at, and certainly this is where I'm at, um, but we also have this massive advantage because we understand the context of our, our own businesses better than anybody else um, until we don't and then it changes. So complexity, I think, is one of those things that's really, really hard. It, you can't really underestimate how difficult it is to be um, trying to operate in a world that's kind of constantly changing and really super complex, especially when we try and break things down in the traditional way so that we can kind of find and fix things. We're also, I think, um, driven by um, what makes us feel good. So our organisations reward the find and fix um, and we feel comfort in it because it's really tangible. It, it's really, you can get a program and you can roll a program out and then your program's finished and it feels kind of good that you've done something. I think when you're working in complexity, it, it's much harder to be able to demonstrate some of that tangibility that we were able to hang our hats on in the past, which makes it really tricky. I guess the other thing is that we're not just dealing with um, ourselves and our own personal journey, but we're also working through other people because our organisations are people. So um, 
we're dealing with people's emotions, people's um, relationships um, and the sunk cost, I think, from a professional point of view, whether it's a a safety professional's point of view or just a business um, point of view. So I think rushing in too quickly um, and to do this whole piece around find and fix, um, we might actually be doing ourselves a disservice, like additional hours of training, for example, that you often see that as a corrective action on reports. Um, For people who are really actually quite skilled and you know, if that was me, I'd be pretty disengaged by the fact that somebody was trying to teach me how to drive a tanker that I've been driving for 20 years um, and retrain me if they made a mistake. Um, and so I think there's a whole heap of downside on that. So in 2019, uh, it was a Christmas, it was, it was just before Christmas actually, I um, bought a, a copy of Todd's Better Questions because I was thinking, well, opportunity I'm going to sit here and and read a little bit more and that Christmas was the Christmas that in Australia we were gripped by the bushfire crisis and in our business our business responded with agility resilience so much courage and care for the business and also for each other and we had no loss of property no loss of life um, and none of our people had their homes damaged So it was a pretty good outcome for us. So it actually made me really curious about where all this capacity was um, and why we had it. So I decided that, um, you know, we were going to actually try and learn something. So after reading Todd's book, I was feeling a little bit um, confident and went, okay, well, I'm actually going to take what was in that book and have a crack at it. Um, I hadn't been trained and I, you know, I was just having a go. Um, but I was confident that the team that I pulled together for the facilitation had over 100 years of experience between us as safety people. So we could probably come up with a couple of pretty decent questions. Um, so it's really interesting because we all felt really unsure of ourselves. We were stepping into this unknown if you like we'd never done this before it was a little bit challenging for us as professionals we were actually not the experts anymore um and so what we decided to do was we actually were going to put some structure around this so we decided that we were going to go and write a list of questions because that was going to help us to um ask better questions so we wrote a list of questions and then we looked at the questions and we went oh I don't think that they're actually better questions and so we ripped up the questions and we wrote another list of questions and then we said to each other "Mm, they're actually the same questions just reworded to make ourselves feel a little bit better um and they're actually the ones that we've always asked. So we decided that what we were going to do instead of that is we were going to set the scene with the team. We told the people in the learning team that we're going to try something new, that we didn't really, we weren't really sure how it was going to go um, and that we weren't even sure if we were going to do a good job um, and that we were learning as well as they were. We were really curious. Um, and what we wanted to have at the core of the discussion was respect and curiosity. Um, and so we actually ended up with two questions. The first question was, what worked well? And the second question that we got to quite a bit later was, well, what made things harder for you? Um, and we bumbled a little bit. We weren't quite sure how that was going to go. And then we started to bounce our way through this messy but really thrilling conversation. We all held each other up as a team and we stuck to the principles of learning and it was such a fantastic experience for everyone that we ended up talking, taking notes, being really curious. People started to talk and ask each other questions in that group. Um, And when we'd finished, the team came out with a real sense of pride that we'd learned something different, which was fantastic. So since then, we've moved on and we've done some training. We've been working with Todd, Jeff Leth, um, Bob Edwards and Andrew Baker. And we're actually now building some capability in the business in terms of uh, being able to um, know a little bit more about those techniques. And we're having a go about some of these things in the business, like using sticky questions, having blue line, black line conversations at the front line, um, and then bringing them into the forums that we've traditionally used in the business. Um, We've also um, found out a heap of stuff that we just didn't know because people are starting to really 
tell us what's going on um, because we're starting to build trust with the business. Um, and even just changing how we're communicating with our people has made an extraordinary difference in terms of being able to have a really open dialogue where everyone's learning. Um, another example that I think would be worth sharing with you, and I know we've touched on COVID a bit, so I'm not going to go there. We've spoken about that a lot, but I think crisis can come in many forms. But it's worth sharing that, you know, a couple of years ago, we were in the grips of bushfire. This year in Australia, it's been the wettest uh, summer in Australia in history, I think. Um, and um, it's been really difficult. So one of the things that's really vital for our business is to be able to deliver gas to a customer. Um, so um, some of our customers, um, we deliver LPG in, you know, tankers, whether they're 20 tonnes or 40 tonne tankers. Um, and on a particular day, uh, on a wet day in Queensland, we were delivering to a chicken farmer. Um, now, I don't know if anybody knows about chickens, but if you um, don't have the right temperature or constant temperature for chickens, um, they they will actually die. So there was 100,000 chickens. I could be exaggerating. Maybe it was 50,000 chickens in this shed. Um, and the farmer was about to run out of gas. So it was pretty urgent that we made um, it, it, that we made a, an urgent delivery. So a tanker arrived on site and he delivered the gas. Um, now, the farmer was coming out from where he was and our tanker moved over slightly to let the farmer pass. And what happened was that the tanker ended up being bogged because it was really wet. Now, our process is to activate what we call a TERP, which is a Transport Emergency Management Plan, um, so we could get him out of the bogging easily and um, safely. So you can imagine a 20 or a 40 tonne tanker full of LPG you know, it's a pretty dangerous operation to to unbog yourself um, or get or get to that truck um, out of the bog. Um, but he activated the plan as per our process, and we got the truck out safely. There was no death of any chickens, and um, the driver was fine, and everybody was fine. So, I want to ask a question, and maybe you know, it, it's, the question is: Is that do you think that's a success? Or do you think that's a failure? Um, is the system brittle or does it have capacity? Now, I would have thought that that was a success. So it's not perfect, but um, when the system failed, the business was able to recover and meet both the customer needs and the safety needs of the business. Interestingly, um, that business unit had a discussion about that incident um, and they weren't so sure. So in the conversations, the leaders have been expressing how disappointed they were about the choices that the driver had made. Interestingly, drivers have been bogged at that site before um, and in the past, the farmer had brought the vessels down closer to a safer place to load, but that driver uh, didn't know that. So we'd actually failed to learn in this particular situation, but we'd expressed disappointment. We, we actually had this idea that our system had failed because we'd had an incident. So it's just a really interesting example, I think. So in the past, when a job goes well, um, nobody's ever asked any questions about the job. So he, he, he might have been able to, you know, do that and, and it was really successful, but nobody asks any questions. But if it goes wrong, which I don't think that went wrong, but if it does go wrong, there's a whole heap of attention on those particular job. And the question is, is who failed, not what failed. So it kind of um, creates this environment where the whole business is geared um, and, and I think is still geared in our sense to that way of thinking and the absence of incidents, it must mean that we've got good safety. Um, so what I think is that um, this is huge. So when you start really thinking about this and you start thinking about brittleness, you start thinking about sunk cost in terms of people, you start thinking about all of these things, um, what can you do? And I think one of the things it feels like is quite overwhelming 
So I sort of think about starting with small adjustments to improve the work as it's happening um, and how we're really starting now to, be, to begin to even just understand the importance and the skill of our people and how that's really important to think about when things are going well. Um, and one of the things that comes up for us on a regular basis is this question around blame um, and learning and um one of the things that people spoke to us about in one of our learning teams was that at the pointy end of the work, people felt like they were more afraid of filling in the paperwork incorrectly than um, being able to do the job safely or complete the job safely, which was, you know, astounding really. Um, uh, and when we brought this to the leadership team, they actually were scratching their heads Um what do our people mean that, you know, they felt they'd been punished for not filling out the paperwork properly. They, they were kind of a little bit confused. Um, but we forget, I think, that people can feel blamed in many ways. Um, it can be humiliation because, you know, you're the one who broke the safety record or on site or the one who got caught breaking the rule that everyone breaks but you got caught or you're the one who's been written up or given an action out of an audit. Um, and we also need to remember... That um, I think with a deep sense of empathy that blame is not just attributed to the front line. It's also our leaders. Um, for example, if they don't have the right answer, if they can't deliver a result on time or the one where the accident or the injury happened on their watch, it's everywhere. It's unspoken. It's, it's all the way through our culture. And I think, um, we really need to think and work on this all the way through every layer of our organisation. And I haven't got that one sorted out, but I'm working pretty hard on it. Um, so what do you do? Well, for me, it's just about having a go. You just need to start. Um, if you're a reader, read. There's so many great resources out there. You know, Sid and Todd and Eric's work and days where there's so many resources out there um, to tap into. Um, there's also other ways to educate yourself. Reach out to other people. I mean, there's so many people out there have helped me just by, you know, catching up with them on LinkedIn. We talk to our workers and ask them. There's so much generosity, I think, and reciprocity out there, particularly in the last few years. I've never had anyone I've approached say no to me when I've asked them for help. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if we think about this as a community, everyone's trying to learn and nobody's really got this sorted out. Um, the other thing I think is that as practitioners, we're the ones who know our business the best. So nobody else can tell us about our business any better than what we can describe or how we understand our business. Sometimes we might have blind spots and that's really helpful to have fresh eyes, but um, we know the relationships, we know the people, we've got influence in our business as professionals um, and you'll know somewhere to start. You've seen something, I'm sure, that you can't unsee. It's everywhere. Um, so I think your challenge might be, and my challenge is, is about how do I build um, my own competence and the competence it might be of supervisors at the front line that might be a challenge it might be educating your board it might be upskilling your safety team so they feel confident and have the conversation it could be a hundred different things it could be about trying to figure out how to provide psychological safety if you want to use that term in a business um, and how to build trust um, where trust has been lost so many times in an organization by simple acts that sometimes we're not even really conscious that we do I think a word of caution that I would um, that I would um, say is that I think safety to safety differently hop it's not a program to roll out for me it's an evolution of what we're already doing there's some really great stuff that we've already done to get us where we are um, and I see this as a evolution or or a transformation without the fanfare it involves everyone and so don't work in a silo we need each other more than ever in a complex environment um, especially when things are ambiguous or difficult and relationships are key. I know that when I'm um, in a pickle, I call on my mates in the organisation and outside the organisation. Making micro adjustments and asking people what they know um, is just 
really important and there's so many people out there willing to help you. Thank you the so final much, Deidre. Oh, sorry, thought, final thought. I have a final thought and then I'll finish. Um, trust and how it's earned is um, through the smallest moments, not through heroic deeds or coming in on your white horse to fix things. It's the little things. Um, it might not always be visible, but it's earned by paying attention, listening with empathy and care. Um, and if you can't bounce, bumble, it's just fine. <laughs> Excellent, Deirdre. Deirdre, thank you so much. You have given us a wealth of practical examples to take back to our organisations today. Just brilliant. I love your um, the fact that you live your values uh, so clearly and, and um, purposefully. I love your vulnerability and your tenacity in doing safety differently. So and a huge amount of takeaways for us. I feel like you really encourage us today to get out there and to demonstrate courage in those challenging, highly political environments. Sometimes you've told us to try if there isn't a road, just go and build a path, get into it, do something. And you've given us a number of ideas on how to do that. Uh, you've told us to, yeah, you have great ideas, like you said at the end, there, write a strategy, challenge your language, challenge your executive, challenge your safety team, uh, go out there and scrutinise the blue line and the black line. And I love that you said that as safety professionals, we should resist the urge to do what we do so well, which is create stuff. So I think sometimes we're responsible for half the clutter and bureaucracy that exists inside organisations. So thank you for reminding us to stop and listen and build that connection instead. And just uh, and don't rush and bumble forward. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just give it a go. So Deirdre, thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be many people in the audience reaching out to you to get further insights. That was incredible. So I'm going to pass over to Dave now to introduce the panel.